Hello, I'm James Tenser, coming to you from Tucson, Arizona. For several years now, I've been focused intently on understanding the retail media phenomenon, which has profound implications for the way advertising is conducted by brands and also for the retail economic model of retailers throughout the world. Today we're going to talk about a phenomenon that I've been observing that describes how the pendulum has swung, so to speak, from digital retail media back to the in-store environment. So why is this important? Well, a year ago, retail media was taking the digital market by storm. Retailers and other audience aggregators have been trying to monetize shopper data and capture high margin alternative revenues, which yield greater profits as compared to just selling products in the stores. Now this felt pretty new, but in reality, it's been building slowly for three decades. Right now, the focus is returning to the stores because that's still where eight in 10 transactions occur. So let's talk a little bit about why this is so consequential in the present market. eMarketer has tracked the retail media market in the US and says it reached 41 billion in 2022. Its forecast anticipates that it will increase by half again to $61 billion in 2024. At the same time, retail media margins have been measured as high as 70%, which is quite a contrast to the single digit margins, sometimes the low single digit margins, that are commonly reported in the food, drug, and mass trades. Well, investors are very excited about this, as you can imagine, and it re represents potentially an entirely new economic model for retailers who do a good job of capturing the retail media spending by brands. The biggest retailers have been able to set up their own networks to accomplish this. That by the biggest, I'm talking about Walmart, of course, but also Albertsons, Kroger, Home Depot, for that matter, and a number of others that may seem less obvious, including Dollar General. What they all have in common is the scale of their traffic. That's the commodity they're able to offer to brands who want to reach their audiences where they're making decisions to purchase. In the last several years, the focus has been very much on the digital world where these, these interactions are easy to detect and measure and evaluate, but all have the same fundamental value proposition. This is first party data about shoppers that can be accessed in a hyper-targeted way, therefore highly relevant and highly efficient for brands. And there's an opportunity to close the loop and measure those interactions, not only the delivery of the messages, but also the actions that shopper take afterward. For a very long time, retailers have understood that their store traffic had a tremendous value as an audience for brands, but they were not always very sophisticated in how they captured it. Nevertheless, there have been some interesting attempts that go back three decades or more to use such phenomena as digital signage in the store, networks that are location bound, but not highly targeted to deliver messages. Uh, famously, we saw the Walmart in-store network in the mid 1990s, video walls in places like Best Buy and Kmart and Target in that era, and all of which were uh, used primarily to promote products sold in those stores. But they were difficult to measure. 
Many brands felt some pressure to invest. We've sometimes heard the word tax. Um, that's uh, a, a pejorative term in the minds of many advertisers. And the phenomena kind of kind of trundled along, to, to put it mildly, in the, in the late 90s, as I think attention shifted and was focused on the dot-com revolution, which followed uh, uh, around the turn of the century. And more recently, it's been clear that among the largest retailers who have set up significant retail media networks, they're still recognizing that their in-store audiences exceed the size of their digital audiences. This is partly a function of repeat visits to the store, um, the 80% of transactions that are still taking place in the physical environment versus the digital environment. And we're talking about the biggest of the bunch, the Walmarts, Targets, Walgreens, Home Depot, Costco, CVS. It goes on, this top list here that uh, was, was published by eMarketer comes from data from Placer AI. And uniformly it tells us that the potential for the in-store audience is at least as great as the potential for the digital audience. And this is, right now something of a revelation for retailers as they realize there are some pretty big advantages to putting the messages right there at the shelf at the point of decision for the shopper. Not a new idea, but the ability to create messages, deliver them in provable, measurable ways, and to measure the results in terms of activation, conversion, takeaway at the point of sale is becoming far more sophisticated today and it's associated with a tremendous economic opportunity both for brands who like to see their messages delivered right at the moment that they can influence shoppers but also for retailers who see this as a way to change their foundational economics of their business. Now, in the early days, in-store channels included some kind of famous contenders. Lots of folks on this call probably are familiar with Catalina Marketing. Those are the devices that print out coupons at the point of sale in response to uh, items that have been selected in the transaction. Uh, that goes back to the mid-90s, along with Act Media, their instant coupon machine, which was a simple device that delivered a coupon clipped onto the shelf uh, and that could be counted at the point of sale to prove some interaction by the shopper. Uh, there were also such things as floor graphics and a variety of static signs uh, that were sold by such organizations as News America In-Store to create a in-store advertising opportunity and get a little piece of the consumer promotion budget in the stores. Uh, these go back a long way but they had relatively modest impact. Today, and here this slide shows us some of the more modern uh, uh, approaches to in-store channels. Top left, we see video doors. These are semi-transparent doors on the, on the front of cooler cases that can play full motion video as well as display, display products inside. Uh, and they track interaction or engagement by shoppers who stop and look at them. Uh, Tokinomo's robot shelf device, of course, the top center, um, and um, uh, they've had marvelous success with that. Uh, uh, Instacart's uh, new electronic shopping cart, which um, has points of interaction in the device itself, uh, but also can enable self-checkout. So it kind of closes the data loop there. Um, Bottom center is a, a, an interesting device from, uh, uh, from uh, Pick and Watch, which um, uses sensors to identify a shopper's interest in a, in a product at the shelf, and then plays video, relevant video about the product. Um, those sensors, by the way, can be uh, motion sensors, or they also can use uh, uh, tags that are on devices themselves, so when they're lifted, they actually trigger the, the display. And then bottom left and right are two different versions of in-store video from uh, grocery TV. Um, and this is a modern take on an old idea to put 
messaging at the point of decision, at the point of interaction for the shopper. They can capture eyeballs, but, but also measure their engagement. Um, and not pictured here, but some of you will remember a, a, a large network called Coinstar. And um, I spoke with their sales leadership uh, not long ago. And, and you may be aware that Coinstar is a, 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 a network of kiosks located in 60,000 stores uh, in, in a number of countries um, where customers can bring their loose change and have it counted for a small discount and turned into coupons or cash. Um, at this year's Digital Signs Experience trade show, I spoke with their sales leadership about their plans to mount video screens on top of these devices to add an additional form of engagement and message delivery uh, with the added advantage of measurability. So in effect, they have the potential now to put up an instant retail media network with 60,000 locations. And this won't happen quite overnight, but it's happening rapidly and uh, provides another place where brands can get their messages uh, observed close to the points of decision by the shopper. So scale, marvelous thing. Does this increase equal greater value for brands? Well, that's a question worth considering. Well, brands certainly say they expect to invest more in retail media networks and uh, ESPs or, or uh, uh, demand side platforms put up by retailers. And there, there's three things they like the most. They like that they can achieve personalization of their messages at scale. And this is accomplished by having appropriate access to the uh, first party data that the retailers uh, accumulate as part of their shopper interactions, uh, but in doing so in a way that is properly anonymized, so they can reach individuals with the right characteristics in history without necessarily revealing their identities in contrast and con in, in contradiction of, of various laws and rules. Um, they like the ability also to buy these media in a programmatic fashion. And this is a habit, if you will, that they've become accustomed to in dealing with their digital advertising campaigns uh, and places like Google and Facebook and Amazon, certainly, uh, where they've been spending money for years at pretty large levels to make sure that their brand messages are in front of shoppers during a susceptible time when they're searching or in the act of, act of shopping. And then finally, they very much want the closed loop measurability that this kind of platform can bring to them. It's not just enough to deliver efficiently to the right audience. They want evidence of that delivery, so sensing. And they certainly want the ability to, uh, to understand the behaviors which follow. Uh, and, that, and these all have analogs to what they've become used to in the digital world. Views, clicks, dwell times online. Well, they all have similar metrics that should be possible in the store environment. So, how long does the shopper stop and look? Do they watch the whole video? Do they pick up a product? And do they put it in the car? Do they take it to the, to the uh, front end and, and, and buy it? And uh, this kind of information may also be associated with loyalty card data, which could allow such advanced measurements as, is this a repeat purchase for that shopper? At what level of discount caused them to take these actions? This is immensely powerful, powerful for the endemic brands in the retail environment. And uh, they, they want to use this to get a better return on their ad advertising spend. Uh, uh, it's so promising that brands are saying that they expect their share of spend from their marketing budget to continue to grow in 2023. And McKinsey says 90% of brands indicate that. So um, they consider it 80%, consider them our retail media networks to be extremely important to their advertising and marketing network uh, efforts. And 70% of advertisers say that retail media networks are outperforming their other marketing channels and tactics. This is a very strong uh, affirmation of the value of retail media networks for brands overall. Now they just want to be able to reach the audiences everywhere they're deciding and not just in the digital channel. So to kind of sum up then, Retail media really have three distinct but interconnected uh, uh, 
forms of interaction now, or realms of interaction, uh, and those are on-site, on the digital shopping site where shoppers about uh, two out of 10 times are going to make their purchases or delivery or pickup. Off-site, and that includes messages that may be delivered via social channels or other channels that are owned or controlled by the retailer. So the ability to send messages to their Facebook or Instagram page, for example. Um, uh, they may include in-platform selling, which is a growing uh, uh, sector now, although still in the early stages. Um, and of course, those interactions offsite add a secondary data stream based on their re behavioral response that is valuable to both parties in the interaction. Um, uh, Onsite, by the way, is linked closely to the loyalty programs that retailers have put up. And they're an extremely rich source of data that truly has been underutilized for years and uh, is now just coming into their own. Um, and now we can add to that the in-store. And I would argue this is the original retail media. Um, it's making use of digital signage, um, even such devices as interactive shelf labels, digital end caps, kiosks, app, the, the, the shopper app that may be location aware, um, uh, tools for long tail ordering, so the ability to enable shoppers to purchase items that may not be on the shelves but that are available from the retailer's digital side. Um, even sampling and demonstrations can be arguably considered a form of in-store advertising. And if the right information is captured, they can have impact that um, puts it right in there with some of the others. So retailers are starting to understand that their shopper data platform is a core capability for their business. Um, they want to monetize that data by attracting advertising revenue and boosting promoted sales. And brands now understand that hyper-targeting their ad messages and offers can only be accomplished in collaboration with their retail partners and certainly evaluating their impact in the market in a way that, um, uh, that's really informative requires that partnership. Uh, this is a very important principle here that both parties need to work together to achieve the greatest benefits. So where is the shopper in all of this? I mean, how do they feel about in-store media? Well, data from the Point of Purchase Institute suggests that they're pretty positive about it. And uh, 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 only about one in 10 or fewer say they pay absolutely no attention. Uh, they welcome deals and product discovery, even wayfinding to find products in the store. Um, and ultimately, uh, you know, it was 32% that said they like when they tell me about a promotion or a sale. Um, they like when the ads are unique and eye-catching, 22%. 21% um, appreciate being introduced to a new or unique product that may be of interest. And by the way, targeting enables retailers and brands to be much more precise in those introductions. Um, uh, they do appreciate learning about a brand they know and trust. And um, they also appreciate that the message happens to be related to the shopping trip that they're on, the reason that they are being there and their mission. Um, in, in general, uh, consumers respond favorably to this. And they like that they're not getting, that, that they're, they're not getting a dog food ad even though they're a, a cat owner. They like that they're, that they're um, coming in for a certain kind of shopping trip and they're being directed towards products in the vast assortment of the store that they already, based on their past behavior, have expressed some interest in. They like a curated experience. And the brands and the retailers are recognizing that doing this helps them to improve sales, improve, uh, uh, make, make promotions that are more efficient, that are more targeted, perhaps even create action on the part of shoppers without going quite so deep in those promotional offers. And uh, uh, the data that they, that they gain from this is an, allowing them to plan going forward uh, to be uh, more effective with shoppers. So what are some conclusions that we can draw from this resurgence of interest in the in-store environment when it comes to retail media? Well, first of all, retail media are here to stay. This is not just some knee-jerk response or 
Jealous response to revenues that have come in from uh, to, to Amazon.com and Google. Um, retailers realize that they really are in the catbird seat, so to speak, in terms of their retail traffic. Uh, nobody can exceed the traffic that we now see entering a Walmart uh, on a monthly basis, 200 million plus. Uh, few can exceed the frequency of interactions that we see in even regional grocers. And this is a very important factor. Uh, no, no category of retail is more data rich than the grocery environment. And it comes down to simple RFM analysis, doesn't it? Uh, how often did they come? How frequently? How much should they spend each time? This is one of typically the largest relationship that a, a consuming household has is with the grocery store or stores where they shop. And the data that flows from that interaction is richer than any other retail sector. The possible exception, I suppose, is mass retail, but they're really a lot like grocery stores too, aren't they? Uh, that data is a gold mine. For brands, it's an opportunity for retailers to rethink their entire financial structure. And that's what we're in the midst of now. They're seeing their economic model revolutionized by the addition of non-traditional revenue with much higher margins than the products they typically sell in the store. And this opens up a realm of possibilities for retailers to reinvest those additional profits in better service experiences, perhaps in price to be more price competitive, uh, and, uh, and, and to uh, bring more advanced uh, digital tools to the party to help them get, continue to be more competitive going forward. Uh, smaller retailers cannot be left behind here. And when I say smaller, we're talking about companies that are themselves pretty large. Think of the most significant and powerful regional grocery chains in the United States and Canada. Uh, these are companies that uh, may not have the scale, the national scale of a, uh, of a Walmart or soon to be merged Kroger Albertsons, uh, but they are powerful market players in their regions and they need to find appropriately scaled methods to play in this uh, retail media uh, realm and many are. They're finding partnerships, they're finding third party uh, um, platforms that they can participate in. Uh, it's an extremely exciting and uh, an extremely uh, fast moving time for this industry. And they're recognizing that the very value of their businesses, their merger and acquisition call value, for example, may be tied to their ability to drive revenue this way by finally realizing the monetary value of the data they've been collecting for decades. So even if they're digital retail business is small compared to some of those massive national competitors. The 80%, the in-store transactions, yield tremendous value and potential value for brand advertisers. So I would argue that the pendulum has swung. Retailers are recognizing that it's the store that counts. Maybe it's always been the store. And the lessons learned from their um, investments and uh, intense activity to develop their digital businesses are now reflecting back. So they're able to consider that uh, uh, the store is the place. It's where the interactions happen. It's where the decisions happen. It's where shoppers return again and again. And always hoping for uh, an experience that's getting better and better each time they interact. So that's my position on the return to the in-store, retail media redux. I'm James Tenser. I hope you found this short presentation to be of interest and of value. I'd be most happy to hear from any of you in the audience to further this conversation. It's a rich time when it comes to the development of the retail industry. And I think um, uh, we've only seen uh, possibly the tip of the iceberg in terms of the, 
the scale of the changes that are going to be happening over the next several years. I'm James Tenser. Thank you so much for listening.